Well, good morning to every one of you, and welcome, welcome, welcome. Whichever campus you're on, I want to welcome you, and those of you who are uh, part of our online community, wherever you are in the world, uh, we want to welcome you. And one of the things that uh, I'm trying to do as a pastor is help all of us to understand we're all in this together. So um, I can see who's online. And I, uh, Lauren, uh, you are in Texas, and I want you to know we know you're with us. And Maddie, you are in North Carolina, and that's just a sampling of a, uh, of a number of people from around the country. So here's the deal, folks. The church has changed over the last uh, two years. Can I get an amen? Can I get an Amen. And we love it when we get to be together. And I believe God does special things when we're together. I think it's really important that you get out of bed and you get here if you can. But we have an online ministry because not everybody can be here. So with that said, um, I'm glad you're here. And we're going to continue today in a series that we've been in for four weeks. This will be the fourth of five weeks. And we'll finish this next week. It's, it's called uh, The God Within. And what it is is it's just a, a, a chance for us to talk about the Holy Spirit. Now, we're going to do that today. But to get ready, I need you to grab your Bible and open it to Luke chapter, uh, just open it to Luke. And Luke is the third of four biographies of Jesus in the New Testament. So find the New Testament. It'll say Matthew, Mark, Luke, and just find Luke. And uh, I'll show you where we're gonna look in just a moment, but just get that ready. So the God within this series we're in is talking about the Holy Spirit. And, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to take the Holy Spirit from being some vague kind of uh, like ethereal, out there in the clouds kind of a concept, and really try to make sense so that we can have a practical, applicable understanding of who the Holy Spirit is and what, what he's up to. And so that's what we're doing in this series, and uh, we're gonna keep working on this. Now, today, and I need you to understand this, today is part one of two parts under the God Within series. I wanna talk about what difference the Holy Spirit makes. What is, I mean, what difference does it make? But a spoiler alert, it, it, it makes, it, the Spirit makes all the difference in the world. Okay, so I just gotta tell you that. The Spirit makes all the difference in the world. But part one is gonna be today and part two is gonna be next week because I can't get all this in in one message. I gotta set up next week by spending some time helping you to see something today. And that's what we're gonna do. So I'm excited for this and we're gonna get going. So what I wanna do to get, uh, to kind of pick up the conversation, get us, get us thinking about the spirit again, I, I wanna get there by kind of going around the backside of the bush. I wanna ask you, what comes to your mind when you hear this word? Okay, I'm gonna say a word and you, uh, you know, what immediately comes to your mind? Passion. Immediately what comes, passion. Now, I don't know what you think of when you think of passion. A lot of people would say, well, passion has everything to do with heart. I mean, heart and passion go together. Passion obviously has a lot of kind of romantic overtones that you could chase down. Uh, I don't know what you think of when you think of passion, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to understand what the dictionary says the word passion means in today's vernacular, in today's language. So here, here's the definition, all right, straight out of it. Uh, a strong feeling of enthusiasm or excitement for something or about doing something. A strong, uh, it's just this thing, this feeling of enthusiasm or excitement. So with that said, let me ask you this question. This is, you get an answer, it's your answer, it's nobody else's answer, it's your answer. But I wanna ask you the question, what are you passionate about? What are you passionate about? And uh, you might be going, uh, give me a minute, give me a minute. Let me just do something. Let me, let me just go through some possibilities. And, and I'm gonna make a point by going through these possibilities. You just go with me on a journey, all right? What are you passionate about? Uh, it could be a particular sport. You are all about golf, or you are all about baseball, or it's football for you, or it's tennis, or it's pickleball now. You could be about a sports team. Like, you could be all about, you know, like that local team that's 6-0, six, 5-0, uh, oh, oh, whatever it is right now. 6-0, oh, what are we? We've never been here before. This is brand new territory. Uh, you could be about the Cardinals. And, and, and so you, you wear all the jersey, you do all that, you get to the game because you're passionate about the Cardinals. It certainly could be a sports team. It, it could be about, your passion could be about something you recently purchased. I got a brand new house. Man, you got to see my house. I got a brand new car. I got to check out my ride. I got a brand new boat. You got to see this thing. It could be about something like that. It, it could be about your health and your you're passionate about what you eat and you're passionate about your cooking and all that kind of stuff. It could be about health and fitness and you're passionate about your workout routine. You're passionate about how many reps and 
your sets and all that kind of stuff and, and where you do that. That could be your thing. You could be passionate about a certain relationship. Man, I, I love this you know, woman. I love this man. I'm passionate about it. It could be about your kids. I'm passionate about my kids. It could be your grandkids. I'm passionate about my grandkids. It could be about making money. I'm passionate about making money. It could be passionate about spending money. And if you're passionate about spending money, you should marry somebody who's passionate about making money because that's just kind of how that works. You could be, actually, the point I could just keep going. You, you could be a certain class. You're just passionate. I'm passionate about justice. I'm passionate about stopping, you know, human trafficking. I'm passionate about eradicating poverty. And, and that could be your thing. You could be passionate about your pet. You could be passionate about reading. You could be passionate about something you collect. Man, I, I don't know what it is. Coins or trading cards or comic books or shoes. Lisa, my wife, I love you. She's in here. You could be passionate about collecting traffic tickets. I had to say that to balance out the shoes comment, all right? <laughs> you passionate, I'm passionate about that. You could be passionate about uh, traveling or movies or music or a particular music group or photography. You could be passionate about like your hobby. And if, if you have the hobby, like, you know, if it's the best hobby ever, you know, like fishing, you would, it, it makes sense why you're so passionate. You could be passionate about your church. You could be passionate about your faith. You could be passionate about your job. Okay, I just threw that last one in for fun. Because no, you know, I, no way I'm passionate about it. Here's the point. That is a short list. And I know I belabored that, but I just need you to understand there's, there's no number of passions. As many people ex exist, there could be passions that match them. Uh, and that you might be passionately frustrated with me right now because I didn't name yours. But the reality of it is there's so many things that you could be passionate about. Another word for passion, a word we don't use in our language very much these days is the word zeal. And if you ever heard somebody who's zealous about something, zeal and zealous uh, are related to the word jealous, by the way. You're never jealous about anything you don't care about. You're never zealous about anything you don't care about about what are you passionate about how do you know when you found your passion oh your body will tell you you found your passion I mean, you come alive you light up if blood starts flowing man your eyes get big your eyes actually dilate when you're in that and everything is just like clicking away and your voice becomes animated your actions become animated your emotions get invested you usually can't shut up about what you're passionate about because it's your passion it's your passion. So let's just agree to something, and this, all of this is going to a destination, all right? Let's just agree to this, all right? We are known and we are defined by our passions. All right, so in other words, people who know you know that about you. And, and if you didn't have that, they, they would go, no, that's not them, because the person I know in that body is passionate about that thing. If you, you're, you're known and, and you're defined and you're defined by your passion. And I just need you to understand this. Your passions tend to find you and then they de define you. That's how it works. So again, I wanna ask you the question, what are you passionate about? What are you passionate about? Now, set all your passions over there on the back burner for just a moment. And I'm gonna ask another question, all right? If somebody had to like pin you against a wall to get you to say what your purpose in life is, not your passion, your purpose. What would be your purpose? And, and, and go, what do you mean my purpose? Like, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to accomplish? What do you, when you wake up in the morning, what are you trying to get done? Not in a, the today, but today's a part of a bigger story, the story of my life, the story of your life. What are you trying to accomplish? So in other words, when your life is all said and done, what did you want to say and what did you want to get done? What's your purpose? Or do you say, I don't have one? Because see, I want you to understand, you were born to have a passion and you were born to have a purpose. Do you know what those are? Now, listen carefully. When your passion intersects your purpose, write that intersection point. Your passion intercepts your, uh, intersects your purpose. That is the sweet spot of your life. That is the best you you'll ever be your passion and your purpose at that intersection. Now, enough about you, enough about me. Let's put that aside, let's talk about Jesus. What was Jesus, what was Jesus's passion? 
There's so many things you could put here. That, I mean, you also could make a really, really long list. I won't do that. But you could talk about, he was passionate about praying. He was passionate about preaching. He was passionate about doing miracles. He was passionate about serving. He was passionate about giving. He was passionate about the poor. He was passionate about the outcast. He was passionate about his father. He was passionate about the kingdom of heaven. He was, pas- he was passionate about all those things. I want to suggest his greatest passion was none of those things. His greatest passion was something else, which I'll show you in just a minute. And you're never going to understand the passion of Jesus until you understand the purpose of Jesus. What do you mean a purpose? Like, why did Jesus, like, what did Jesus seek to accomplish? Like, what, why, what were you trying to do? Like, what was your life all about? Why did you come? You know, it's interesting. Um, businesses, corporations, uh, churches, ministries usually have a mission statement. We exist for the sake of. For the sake of what did Jesus exist? Now, businesses and churches and whatnot, you declare it. You go, this is what we're all about. This is what we're trying to accomplish. Do you know that Jesus declared his purpose? He, he flat came out and said why he came. You might, might not have seen it. You might not have understood, but let me show it to you. It's, it's crystal clear what he said. This comes from Luke 19.10. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That, that was it. What, what do you mean the lost? Jesus came, his purpose of coming was to go to every single person who's not in a relationship with his father, not right, that that relationship's been severed or broken, and make it right, to seek and to save it, to restore it, to redeem it. In fact, he said it this way in, in John 6, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all of those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And I will raise them up at the last day. See, the passion of Jesus, the, the, the purpose of Jesus was to seek and save the lost. You know what that meant? It meant his passion was people, people. Now, can I get real clear? His passion was you. That was his passion. You were his passion. He, he, he came to make sure you don't end up going to hell. And he's passionate about that. You, 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 you don't think about this, but it's interesting if you do. If you read the Bible, it's all these conversations Jesus has with people. You see a very clear pattern. Let me, let me just show you a little bit, all right? In, in Matthew chapter four, verses 18 to 20, and they'll pop up here, it says this, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen, just doing their thing. Come, follow me. He, he sees these two brothers, this Simon and, and Andrew, they're, they're blue collar workers out there making a living, doing, and he says, follow me. Now, When you hear the words, follow me, I hope, church, that you associate this with Luke 9, 23. If anyone wants to come after me, here's the invitation. Die to yourself, uh, like humble yourself, die to yourself, and commit to follow. That's what he was offering them. Humble yourself, die to yourself, and and go on a journey with me. Now, what you're gonna discover is when Jesus invited people to do that, they said yes. Not everyone, not all the time, but usually they said yes. Peter and Andrew said yes, Philip. John 1, the next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. And Philip said, yeah, yep, I'll go. Matthew, this is fascinating to me. Matthew, um, so I asked you to turn to the book of Luke, and I said it was the third of four biographies. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these are the guys' names who wrote those biographies. Matthew, this guy was a tax collector, when, when he came to Jesus, he went by a different name. He went by the name Levi. Let me, let me show you something, all right? So Matthew 5, uh, Luke, excuse me, 5, 27 says, after this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at, the, at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up and left everything and followed him. What, what do you mean follow me? Humble yourself, die to yourself, go on an adventure with me. And Matthew did, ended up writing a gospel. We can talk about the woman at the well, which he's got in this conversation with a Samaritan woman, and she comes to faith. You can talk about wee little Zacchaeus, the little guy up in the tree, 
uh, he came to Jesus, Barnabas, Jesus, blind Barnabas. Jesus said, come, follow me. Get on this journey. We can talk about this crazy man, this garrison demoniac, this guy that was demon-possessed and chains are hanging from him. And he, you know, Jesus lands on the shore and this crazy man, out of his mind, a maniac, comes at Jesus and slides right at his feet and, and Jesus heals him. And then he's in his right mind. You could read the story. And then the guy immediately wants to get in the boat with Jesus because he's going, wherever you're going, I'm going with you. And Jesus says, you know what I need you to do? I need you to go back home and make a difference with the people. You see, you don't think about this, but everywhere Jesus, he's hanging on the cross and there's one guy on one side mocking him. The other guy's going, dude, shut up already. You know who this is? And Jesus turns and says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Always, always, always looking for the opportunity to bring somebody home with him everywhere he went. Now, since his purpose was to bring salvation, here's what I want to tell you his passion was, if you haven't heard it yet. People, you, you were the passion of Jesus. The thing that got him excited, the thing that enthused him, got him motivated. And if I want to be real clear, people who are outside that, that haven't yet found their way back home are who he's most passionate about. We're not, by the way, just so we're clear. That's been the perennial problem of the church. We, we so quickly make all of the story of God about us and our family and our church family. And whenever we do that, and we matter to God, don't, make, don't hear that, I'm not saying we do. I just need you to understand somebody who's not walking with him is the one that he wakes up thinking about, like all the time, that person's on their mind, on his mind, not usually on our mind. He, he walked by the city of Jerusalem and he says he just broke down and wept. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, what I could have done for you. And he looks at you if you're away from him and he just weeps. He goes, what I could have done. His passion is that you would come home, that you would come home. Now, I want to remind you of something. The intersection of your passion and your purpose is the sweet spot of your life. You need to think about your passion. You need to think about your purpose. Now, I want to take you on a quick journey, all right? I want to take you on a quick journey, and we're going to end up in Luke here in just a moment. But let me get you to Luke by, by way of uh, the book of Isaiah. In the book of Isaiah was written 700 years before the time of Jesus. Now, here's what I need you to understand. Isaiah was a prophet, which meant that God gave him the ability to say things that were gonna happen in the future. And in uh, Isaiah chapter nine, uh, verses six and seven, he said uh, prophetically, for unto you a child is born. Does this ring a bell? Uh, he's gonna be a, you know, mighty. This incredible person is coming. It was a prophecy about the coming of the Messiah. And then he says, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The passion of God is gonna be on this coming savior. You get to the 61st chapter of the book of Isaiah, and it's a prophecy about this Messiah. And let me show you what it says. I think this is very interesting. Isaiah 61, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. This is prophetically the, the Messiah speaking, all right? 700 years before the time of Jesus, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me, now watch what he's been anointed to do, to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, release from darkness for the prisoners, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So the people in Isaiah's days are going, how are we gonna know? How, what do we look for? From that day forward, they kept looking for somebody. What do we look for? What's the sign? The one who has the spirit of the sovereign Lord on him. That's the one who's gonna be the fulfillment of this prophecy. Now, lock that away. Hundreds of years passed, and then along comes Jesus. Now, in your Bible, be in Luke chapter four, but before you get to four, let me show you something that happens in chapter three. So Jesus is born, Okay, the ch our child is born. Now, well, how are we gonna know it's him? Is this the Messiah? Is this the one? Luke chapter three, verses 21 and 22 says this. Watch, watch. 
When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. As he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice from heaven came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. How are we gonna know? The one who has the spirit of the sovereign Lord on him, that will be the one. And the heavens open, a spirit in the form of a dove, a voice, Father, Son, Spirit. This is the one. This is the one. You go to Luke chapter 4, verse 1, it says this. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. So the Spirit of the Lord descends on him in chapter 3. And then he leads him into the desert in chapter four. After, in the, into the wilderness, which is the desert of, of, of the Jordan. It's the region between the Jordan River and Bethany, the, like the Mount of Olives, that area. It's just vast nothingness on the backside of that mountain. That's where Jesus was tempted. Look at chapter four, and we're gonna read this together because I wanna show you what happens next. Verses 14 on down to 19. It says, um, so he was tempted in the desert, in the wilderness. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Got to mark that phrase. In the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him. This guy's phenomenal. Who is this guy? Uh, He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. Well, we know who this one is. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read. Now watch carefully. He's the guest speaker in the synagogue that day. And he stands up and he asks the attendant, would you hand me a scroll? Now you gotta understand, we could just open a Bible or click on our phone. There, literally, there were boxes that had the scrolls of the, of the Old Testament, okay? They're, they're on scrolls, and there are multiple scrolls if they're long books. And, and he asked for this passage. So look, look. Um, And uh, so he stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed him. Now unrolling it, he found the place where it was written. So he's unrolling it. He's he's rolling it, unrolling it, rolling it. And he, he gets down to this passage. Watch, watch. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. What did he just say? What did he just say? Do you understand what he said? He, He gets the scroll and he goes, this right now, this passage, uh, he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, sat down. The eyes of everyone on the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. They're going, what? You know what he's saying? The spirit of the sovereign Lord has come upon me. And in the power of that spirit, I'm making that claim. And now, if you keep reading, you're gonna discover it uh, a little bit rocky. <laughs> from that point on, but I want you to understand, Jesus made it very clear. I've come to bind up brokenhearted people, set people who are imprisoned free, not just don't think just a prison, think bound. People who are hurting, who are oppressed, good news, good news. I wanna show you something else. In uh, Luke chapter five, just the next chapter, Verses 31, 32, he's kind of called out and uh, the religious people want a little more attention. And by the way, that's always the problem with us religious people. We always think we get more God, that we have more right to God and like God should always be about us and he's about us, there's no question. But we forget about them who aren't us. They're not part of us. They're outside the fold. Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but 
sinners to repentance. You guys, don't make my purpose about the holy saved ones. Don't, don't declare that as my purpose. I've not come. I've come to bring people home. If you're already saved, you're already home. You're already home. You're already a part of the family. See, what Jesus is trying to communicate is, folks, there's so many people out there who don't live with the hope you live with. Why don't you care? That's what he's saying to me. That's what he's saying to you. Why don't you care? And you don't think this was a point? If you go to Luke 15, it's all in the book of Luke. Go to Luke 15. He tells three little stories. This is his lead-off story. You ready? This is Luke 15, 3 through 7. Listen, all right? Then Jesus told them this parable. A parable is a little story. Right? Suppose one of you has 100 sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And, and when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and he goes home and he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons that do not need to repent. See, we think the party's always about us. That's our problem. And that is exactly what happened there. And then he tells the story of the 10 coins, and then he tells the story of the two sons. And the son that was lost comes home, and the older brother is so put out that the party happened on behalf of the one that was lost. Um, why, why do we always have a problem with Jesus going after the one? He made it very clear, I'm going after the one. I'm going after the one who's not been found. Why are we so put out with that? We're the good ones. Why don't you focus on us more? Why don't you give us more of your attention? You know, that one deserves to get eaten by some wolf because it wandered off on its own. And Jesus goes, no, you're, you're fine. You're good. You're good. What does he know? Why is he so focused? Can I, can I drop an idea on you right here? Listen, this is probably the most important thing I want to say today. Please listen. Can I tell you why Jesus is so focused on people who are not yet home? If you're a Christian, this world that you're living in right now, if you're a Christian, this world is the closest to hell you will ever be. If you're a believer in Jesus, this messed up, jacked up world we're living on and in, this is as close to hell as you're ever gonna experience. I know it's hard. This is as close to hell you're ever gonna come, but... It is also the closest to heaven a lost person's ever gonna be. Please let that soak in. This messed up world is the closest a lost person's ever gonna get to heaven. And this is as good as it's ever gonna get, folks, if you're not with God and you don't come home. This is as good as it gets. And if this is as good as it gets, you have every reason in the world to be depressed. But it's not as good as it gets. This is as bad as it gets. If you're on the other side of one decision that would change everything, the purpose of Jesus' life was to bring salvation. His passion was focused on people who don't yet get it. Now, I only have three years to get done what he was trying to get done. I only have three years. You want to see focus? You want to see focus? He starts his ministry. I already read the passage that started his ministry. Let me read it to you again. Let me show you something. Okay, watch carefully right here. I'm gonna show you something I think is so profound. In Matthew chapter four, we already read this. I'm gonna read it again, but I'm gonna keep reading past the point I originally stopped reading. Matthew 4, 18. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said. That's where I stopped. And I will send you out to fish for people. You, you think you have purpose now? You think you have passion now? Follow me. And I'm gonna put you on an adventure that's gonna change your life. And immediately left their nets and followed him. That's the, first, that's the first calling, right there. You know what the last thing Jesus said? Now, not the very last thing, which I'll show you in just half a moment, but you know the last thing Jesus said right before he like, ascended back? After 
after he lived his three years of ministry, and that was from age 30 to 33, if you're not tracking, uh, after they crucified him, he gathered his disciples together, and he said this, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Jesus came to them, and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. His first thing was, come, and I'll send you out to fish for people. His last thing, go fish for people. Now, you go, why in the world are we talking about this? What does this have anything to do with the Holy Spirit? Could it be that God's sending his Holy Spirit unto you and into your heart is for more than just blessing you? Could it be a bigger purpose? You you know what? In in the upper room, just before Jesus was going to go out and literally be crucified, he said this. I'm going to send you on a mission. I'm going to give you a purpose. But, but listen, but the advocate, John 14, 26, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he'll teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. See, see I can imagine, like if I were sitting around the upper table and Jesus is going, I'm going to send you out and, and you're, you're going to go fish for me and, and, and you're going to go out and you're going to represent me. I'd be going, oh, my knees would be buckling. Oh, no, no, don't send me. Don't send me. Send, some, send somebody qualified. Send somebody who knows something. And Jesus goes, oh, no, 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 don't relax, relax, relax. I'm going to send the Spirit that's going to teach you and remind you of everything I've taught you. Don't worry. Don't. You have nothing to worry about. Let, let me show you another one. All right. And again, I'm just stopping at two. I can show you more. Luke 12, 11. I, I, I don't no, no, it's too much pressure. They, they're going to they're gonna put me in. They're going to press me for answers. I don't have answers. When you are brought, Luke 12, 11, when you are brought before synagogues, rulers, and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourself or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. Oh, God, I'm so scared, man. Don't, don't, I'm going to choke. Don't, don't, don't worry, don't worry. I'm going to... I'm going to go, but the Spirit is going to come, and when the Spirit comes, he's got your back. Don't worry about it. You're going to be fine. Just do what I asked you to do. It's going to be fine. I got it. Now, can I read you the very, very last words of Jesus as recorded in Scripture? Uh, this is, uh, the, as before he ascended, this is Acts chapter 1, a very, very important verse, and this is where we're going to start next week, and I'm going to show you how this plays out. Jesus says this. They're wanting to know what's coming, what's coming, what's coming. And Jesus says, Acts 1-8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When the Spirit comes on you, who's the Messiah? The one on whom the Spirit fell. And he says, you know what? I'm going to leave, but I'm going to send my spirit and he's going to fall on you. Power, power is going to be, power is going to be the definition of your life. You're going to receive power. I'll show you what that means next week. Power for what? Power to power up on people, power to be the boss, power to have my way, power to live my selfish life, power to what? Hmm. Let's go back to where we started. Stay with us. Make this connection, okay? What are you passionate about? What are you passionate? What do you get emotional about? What do you get amped up about? What is that thing that you're known for? All right? What is that? Let me ask you a question. I know you're passionate. What price are you willing to pay for that passion? Because that passion doesn't come free. That passion is not cheap, whatever that is. I mean, greens fees, come on. Come on. Uh, You know, buy a boat. Come on. It's not cheap. What are you passionate about? That camera, because you love photography? That's, if you're passionate, you don't have, you're not using an iPhone. What are you passionate about? How much are you willing to sacrifice for your passion? What's that cost you really? In time? In money? In energy? Opportunity costs? That you can't do something else? Why do you do that? Why are you so passionate about that? You just go, I just am. I'm made that way. I just... I care about that. Hmm. 
priority. So is that bad that you're so passionate about that? Okay, ready for this? Okay, I'm going to say something provocative. I don't think Jesus gives a flying flip over what your passion is. Now, don't take an insult. That's why all of us have different passions. I don't think he's upset at all that you're so passionate about that thing. But here's an idea. What if, what if you channeled your passion into his purpose for your life? You don't have to feel guilty that you have that passion. What if you channeled your passion into his purpose for your life? What's his purpose? Follow me. Follow me where I'm going. And what, what if, it's to say it more holistically, what if you saw everything differently, like where your time's invested, where your money's invested, where your energy's invested, where your heart's invested? What if you used your passion to accomplish his purpose, to bring people to Jesus? So, hey, I, I don't just play golf. I play golf on purpose. I don't just fish, I fish on purpose. I don't just collect stuff, I collect friends on purpose. I don't just eat because I like food. No, oh, no, no, I eat on purpose. I don't, I don't just go to the gym and you know, work out so I can build my body. I go to work out so I can build his body. What if you used your passion for his purpose? Now. I'm going to close right here, but I want you to hear what I'm about to say, all right? I'm going to repeat something. I'm going to say something different. This world is the closest to hell you're ever going to come if your heart's right with God. The worst of it's over when you die. It's nothing but better. If you're not with God, if you're not right with God, this is as good as it's ever going to get. And it's not good enough for him, for you. He's got something so much better. Okay, now listen carefully. In this world, you might be the closest a person ever gets to God. You. Why? Why? Last week, God's living in you. You might be the closest a person's ever going to get to heaven. You're the closest anyone is that someone, maybe that someone is ever going to get to God. Do you think it's an accident you have this passion? Do you think it's an accident that Christ has this purpose? You want to know what difference the Spirit of, Holy, of the Holy Spirit makes in our lives? You're the difference. This is the difference. God wants you to take your passion merge it to his purpose. You want to find your sweet spot? Love what you do, but do it for him. Part one, I'll pick this up next week. You come back. Let me pray and we'll continue in our worship, all right? So Father, uh, maybe when this is all said and done, we're gonna see something different. And when we talk about your spirit, again, it gets very vague very quickly. And maybe it's not meant to be vague at all. Maybe this is meant to be crystal clear. Maybe the reason your spirit is living within us is because there's a reason for our lives. And that just as you invited uh, Simon and Andrew to come and follow, you're inviting us to come and follow, not for the sake of us, but for the sake of your purposes. And God, we get lost on so we become, we can become passionate about so many things and spend all our money on that, all our time, all our energy, and we're going to die as old, empty people wishing we'd have done something worth living for. Or we can take our passion, marry it to your purpose, intersect that in our life, and all of a sudden, our life has meaning like it's never had. And our passions have purpose. Help us, Father, to figure this out and live it out. And bring everyone here back next week and more for us to understand how we get this wrong when we make the gifts you give us, the object and not the purpose of our mission. So to that end, Father, we commit. Amen.
thank you guys very much for being here. John.